Happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This morning, we start a new series called Identity. It will unfold probably for the next seven or so weeks. But we want to thank you for your faithfulness in joining us. Last week, Pastor Fine gave a very powerful sermon um, relating our lives and connecting it to the life of Job. And today we want to talk about identity. And so before we begin, I would like to ask you all to close your eyes with me and we'll ask God to be with us. As I kneel here, uh, if you can kneel, please join me. If you can't, that's okay. Just bow your heads and we'll pray before we begin. Let's pray. Almighty God in heaven, thank you so much for the beautiful Sabbath morning you've given to us. We as your people are meeting this morning. But as this sermon is being replayed and relayed and uh, rewatched by many others, Lord, it may be on a different day, maybe on a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday or a morning or an evening, it doesn't matter where. But we pray that, Lord, this word will come out of our life and touch our lives and change us so that we will no longer be the kind of people we are right now, but become transformed into your likeness and be like you. Bless us now, we shall pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, um, identity is a very, very important, uh, important topic because without the sense of being who you are and knowing who you are, where you come from, why you are here, and where you are headed, it can spell confusion and anxiety, and many people have committed suicide because of that. Imagine a child growing with no mother or no father. It can be very difficult to find meaning and identity in those circumstances. Imagine a child growing up without both father and mother, or someone who is born out of wedlock, or someone who is lost between the presses of cultural tensions, or a husband and wife divorcing, or a young man or a woman failing exams, or a young man or a woman inve investments fails. And when failure becomes part of life, suddenly we lose focus on who we are, and we ask ourselves, what is the meaning of living? Because the pressure that is exerted on us by society is that if you be something or someone in life, that defines the meaning of your life and that constitutes identity. And when what you think you could do best, when what you think you, 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 you are born to do fails, the confusion comes in and identity disappears and it is a dangerous recipe for suicide and other mental illness to take place. So identity is important. That is talking about identity uh, on an individual level. But how about religious identity? How about understanding the meaning of Christian, what it means to be a Christian, and why we are Christian? And and what is the intention and purpose of Christian, uh, Christianity? All those questions can be confusing as well. So identity is a very serious title that we will go through, and I want you to join us as we go through this. Today, under this identity, we will be looking for the identifying mark of Jesus Christ. So that's why the question that I want to ask is, who is this Jesus? Who is he? Uh, it is interesting that Jesus is one Jesus we know. Jesus is the father of Christianity. But the different perspective of Jesus everyone has in this world is not one and identical. So that's why this morning's talk or sermon is committed to identifying the genuine identifying mark of Jesus the Bible, which we will not finish this morning, 
but we will continue next week under this same title. So in the book of Exodus, chapter 5 and verse 2, we read this particular uh, verse. And the verse says, And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord. So in other words, King Pharaoh was reluctant to let the Israelites go on the basis that he did not know the Lord God Almighty. Now, maybe we can ask questions like, well, did he not know it or is he pretending his ignorance? Well, the Israelites and Joseph, when they lived in Israel, they certainly had an impact in the civilization of Egypt. So that means everybody knew who Joseph was. Everybody knew the history of the famine that saved the entire civilization because Joseph came in and interpreted the dream. And, and as a result of that interpre inter interpretation of the king's dream and the wise counsel that King, uh, well, Joseph provided, a whole civilization was saved. So that means that this guy, this pharaoh, who is asking this question is not asking in genuineness and in sincerity. You see, there are some people who honestly don't know God, but others who do know God, but they intentionally pretend to not to know God. It seems to me that King Pharaoh comes under this category of someone who knew God, but he is rebelling against that knowledge and is questioning the strength and the might of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Why is he saying that? Because I said that some time ago in one of my sermons here, is that he has ultimately become the God of Egypt. He's not just a political head. He's not just the head of a monarchy. He is also the head of the spiritual realm. So therefore, if he is going to be king in the world of the gods out there, and he is the king of the material civilized civilization of Egypt, then he is actually arrogant when he says, I don't know this God. So the question now is that there are many people in this world who may say, I don't know God, from that perspective. And so we have to be very cautious of the people who express those kind of opinions. And then we must make sure that our desire to know God must not be compounded and confused by all those voices who know God, but intentionally deny the existence of God. So it is very important that we look at how God reveals himself and identifies himself as the one and the only true God, the one humanity is in need, the one you and I are in need of him. You know, this is a poem uh, coming from Gloria and Bill Gaither. It's actually one of the songs. And I like this. I've, I have, I've heard the song, but I like the words. So, you know, look at this. I'm, I've just put it up there, and I'm going to read it. Jesus, Jesus, there is just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away. But there is something about that name, Jesus. So when King Pharaoh said he didn't know the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, is it possible that today many people may say the same thing of this Jesus that we know? Jesus, Jesus, there is something about that name. Did you know that kings have tried to get rid of the name Jesus? Philosophers have come up with ideas to excuse it out that the story of Jesus doesn't make sense. Or empires have tried to destroy it so that the name of Jesus never exists in successive generations. But for some reason, my brothers and sisters, the name of Jesus has existed through those different challenging times. So Jesus is someone that can be loved by multitudes, or Jesus is someone 
that can be aided by multitudes. And may I also suggest that Jesus is someone that could be misunderstood. As I put it up on the screen for you there, the most understood name Jesus, the most aided name Jesus, and perhaps the most misunderstood name Jesus. You see, Jesus is one. And how seven billion people know that name Jesus is completely different. And so we will go slowly and see how the Bible reveals Jesus. You know, one time the Bible says, you know, uh, about the misunderstanding of Jesus Christ in many, many places. But who is this Jesus Christ? The question creates misunderstanding. The misunderstanding of Jesus is perhaps the reason why we are all not united. The fact that there are so many denominations existing in this world. The fact that there are three powerful monotheistic religion, Islamic religion or Muslims, and Jewish religion and Christianity, all sprang out from that root of one God that existed. The fact that we, humanity, has found it difficult to come together after claiming to know that one source tells a very amazing story. As I was thinking through what I wanted to share with you, I just realized that God has revealed himself, that one God has revealed himself. But how humanity has received the revelation has been fragmented. And the reasonable question is, why is that? Uh, why is that? You see, I believe that a correct understanding of Jesus would make us genuine converts, genuine converts. That correct understanding can only exist because of the power of the Holy Spirit descending upon us and revealing to us. So what I'm saying is this, when we have the perfect revelation of Jesus Christ, that is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in us. The perfect understanding of Jesus is not a measure of intelligence and IQ, no. The perfect understanding of Jesus is a measure of the presence of God or the presence of the Holy Spirit among humanity. When the Holy Spirit is in us, the Holy Spirit reveals. So in other words, when we probably want to understand Jesus, we can only understand Jesus through the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus Christ to us. Now, look at this text in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 13. The Bible says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the son of man, man am? So in this particular text, we see Jesus Christ himself even worried. He is wondering whether he is being correctly understood. So he's asking this question. He's saying, whom do men say that I am? And look at how the disciples responded to that question in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 14. And this is how they responded. They said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. Others say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Can you imagine the fragmented answer that disciples gave? Yet is one Jesus, that one Jesus spoke and taught in the temple, that one Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, and did many and every wonderful works. That one Jesus, they had him preaching, teaching. Yet the multitude, after listening and observing that one Jesus, went home saying, oh, he must be John the Baptist. Oh, he must be Elijah the prophet. Or he must, he must be Jeremiah the prophet. Or he's probably one of the prophets. Or something, well, I don't know. I don't know. So all I'm saying is this. Looking at that one Jesus is possible. The whole of humanity can look at that Jesus. The whole of the denomination of the Christian religion can see that Jesus. But the amazing thing is that when they see Jesus, they can go back to their own little homes and settlements and organizations, and they come up with a completely different version of that one Jesus, so much so that 
they don't agree among themselves. Now, Jesus Christ has the next question. He says, Matthew 16 and verse 15, he says, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? So he's coming home to his own disciples. And he's saying, well, that is what the people out there think of me. But what do you think of me? And you know what? These people did not give an answer. The majority of the disciples who were sitting with Jesus sat there quiet. Why? Because it seems as if the opinions that they were expressing reflected their own opinions as well. So they kept silent, but a silence broke in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 16. This is Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. The answer that Jesus Christ was looking for came out of one individual by the name of Simon Peter. Now, is it possible, my brothers and sisters, that we are many people reading the Bible, listening to the story of Jesus, but is it possible that we can draw wrong conclusions instead of seeing Jesus of the scriptures as the Christ, the Messiah, the way Peter saw, we may end up seeing someone else or something else. Now, I want to ask this question. Why is it that people see the same Jesus but end up drawing wrong conclusions? Now, in John, uh, Matthew again, chapter 16 and verse 17, this is how Jesus himself responds or affirms Peter's response. We read here, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bazona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Did you hear that? Flesh and blood hath not revealed it to you, but my Father in heaven. The difference between having a perfect revelation of Jesus Christ or the correct revelation of Jesus Christ and having a very wrong revelation of Jesus Christ, the difference is that someone has been revealed the story of Jesus while someone else is attempting to interpret the revelation of Jesus according to his own perspective. So, I learned one very important lesson when I was thinking through this process. And one very important lesson I learned is that every one of us, when we come to Jesus Christ, we come with our own specific biases. Look, I am from the highlands of Papua New Guinea. Enga province is where I come from. So my psychic, my mindset, my attitude, my way of reasoning, and, and my perspective to life is molded by that background that I grew up in. So that means that when I come to Jesus, I may think that Jesus is an hanging man, or Jesus is a man from Papua New Guinea, or Jesus is a, is a black man. So that means that I may be tempted to get that Jesus and mold Jesus into the image that I am coming with to see Jesus Christ. You see what's happening? In this, the Bible says God created man in his image out of dust. So that means God took dust out of the earth and saved man in his image. It seems like the reverse is taking place in the this, in this, in this story that I'm telling you. Instead of God creating us using the power of the Holy Spirit, we come with our own clays and mud of our backgrounds and our biases and our own personal interests and preferences. These are the things we come with. And then we try to create a Jesus out of the real Jesus. And could it be that that is one of the reasons why we see the same Jesus, yet we end up saying completely different and religious disagreement are so fierce that sometimes families can split. And I've heard that some people say that if you are a Jehovah's Witness, you shouldn't marry 
someone else. Or if you are a member of this church, you should marry someone else. So in other words, what's happening here is that it becomes so powerful that it goes way down to the very fibers of your feeling that the perspective that you leave determines everything else that you choose to do and live by. So all I'm saying is this, my brothers and sisters, it is crucial in these very chaotic times that we must let go of our own perspectives and biases, our cultural backgrounds and orientations, and everything we must let go. And we must come sincerely, honestly, with an inquiring mind, looking for Jesus, not, not trying to create a Jesus of our own, own character. We must come looking for Jesus. One time in John chapter 5 and verse 39, we find this text, the Bible says, Jesus is making this statement. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness to me. This is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. So in other words, he's telling the Pharisees because these Pharisees make no mistake. These guys knew the Bible. They memorized the Bible. They went through rabbinical schools to literally put the, put the all that was chapters and verses of the Torah into the mind. They write them down on the garments walking around. They knew the Bible. But you see the difference between knowing the Bible that way and while knowing the Bible that way, there is a possibility that you can miss the point. What is the point? In this particular text, Jesus is telling us that you are searching the scriptures thinking that you will find eternal life in the Bible. But do you know that the Bible is actually talking about me? What is Jesus saying? If you don't read the Bible to find me in Jesus there, then you miss the mark. What is the mark? Eternal life. Just by reading the Bible without Jesus in mind, without looking for Jesus in the scriptures, you will, like the Jewish, lose eternal life. That's what Jesus, it is really frightening. If you're a Christian sitting and listening or standing and listening or wherever it may be that you are watching, I want to encourage you, be careful how you listen to the name of Jesus Christ. Be careful how you read the Bible. Do not read the Bible with your own ideas. Do not read the Bible with your own preferences. Do not try to twist the meaning of the Bible to support your own biases. The moment you do that, you will miss the point. So what Jesus is saying is this. We have to read the Bible to find Jesus Christ. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, misunderstanding of Jesus Christ is related to that. Misunderstanding of God among men is perhaps the reason why God is patient. Jesus probably would have come a long time ago. That's my own assumption. Why am I saying that? Well, you may be saying, well, how, what the, how does that pastor know the day and hour? Yeah, I know. We don't know the day and the hour. But if you look at some Bible examples, like the Exodus story, it was, it was unnecessary. It was not needed for the children of Israel to wander 40 years. But why did they wander 40 years? It's not God's plan. It's in their own choice. Their refusal to believe in God's leading cost them to wonder 40 days, uh, 40 years. Could it be possible that our misunderstanding of God and misunderstanding of Jesus is the reason why saints and disciples and the church of God in this world is still wandering through the wilderness as it were in this world? That's what I'm saying. It's probably because we have misunderstood who this Jesus is. That's why God is patiently allowing us to exist a little longer so that the correct notion and the knowledge of Jesus can be received by many of us who probably have a perfect version of the story of Jesus. Now look at this text here. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Bible says, The Lord's, the Lord's long-suffering to us would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God is patient. He is not coming too quickly. 
He is not ending the world too quickly. Why? Because his patience is man's opportunity. Why is he patient? Because he's not willing that any should perish. Why is it that we are perishable creatures living and therefore is patient? We are perishable creatures because we have not yet understood Jesus correctly. It doesn't mean, I'm not saying we haven't read the Bible. I'm not saying we haven't gone to church. I'm not saying we haven't been praying or anything like that. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that our prayer life, our reading of the Bible, and everything seems to be coming from a particular perspective that is so biased and misconstrued to an extent that the Jesus of the Scripture is not coming clearly out in our attempt to know the Bible. So God is patiently waiting for us. Wow. So the next part of the discussion today is that I want us to trace through the Old Testament and find out how the, the Old Testament church misunderstood the prophecies of the Messianic, Messianic prophecy, how they misunderstood. I'll just briefly go through because I want us to learn some of the lessons of their failures and mistakes of misunderstanding God. And hopefully we will try to correct our misunderstanding if there are some misunderstanding existing even in our time today. So let's look at this one here. In the book of Matthew, if you look at the first chapter, you'll find a very long, boring chapter. I call it boring because it's the name of names of people listed there. It's actually the names of the ancestors of Jesus Christ. The book says the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. That is how Matthew lists Jesus' ancestors. So what Matthew does is Matthew calls Jesus and calls Jesus' father's name and links it to Abraham. And then when you go to the book of Luke, what Luke does is Luke traces uh, Jesus' ancestors from the time Jesus is born to Adam. In Luke 3 and verse 38, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So in other words, Jesus Christ is linked to Adam. So Matthew linked Jesus to Abraham and David. Luke links Jesus to Adam. So this is what you find here. These are these two, two stories. Okay, Matthew is linking Jesus to Adam. Sorry, Luke is linking Jesus to Adam. And Matthew is linking Jesus to Abraham and David. Now, why are they doing that? They're doing that because Matthew is writing his letter primarily for a Jewish audience. He's writing for a Jewish audience, so he wanted every Jew to know that Jesus is a Jew and his savior or his saving act, his delivering act is for the Jewish nation. And the promises that God made to Abraham was intended to come through Jesus Christ. That's what Matthew is doing about the story of Jesus. Whereas Luke, on the other hand, he is telling the story of Jesus to the Gentile world. They are not Jewish people. So what he is doing is he is linking Jesus to Adam, who is the father of the human race. So by doing that, what Luke is saying is that Jesus is yours too. Do not think that Jesus is only for the Jewish people. He is for the blacks of Africa or the Chinese and Indians and other races of people that may be living during the time that Jesus belongs to them as well. So these two disciples are very interesting authors because they are trying to describe Jesus for the audience that they are writing for. So what is the point? The point is that Jesus must be known but a human race. Everyone need to know. Everyone need to know. Okay, that is the point. Now, the other thing is that if you look at these stories, the, the stories of Jesus as recorded by Matthew and as recorded by Luke, there are some common names mentioned in the list of the ancestors of Jesus. Men like Jacob, Judah, Rahab, Ruth. Now, why did Jesus... I mean, why these authors are writing 
this individual's name. I call them the unlikely candidates. Why are they unlikely candidates? Well, look at his list here. Jacob, he was a deceiver. He was a deceiver. Judah, he was a man who visits prostitutes. Now, you know what kind of man that is. Rahab was a prostitute, and he was a Gentile. Ruth was a despised person, marginalized, Moabite. King Solomon, he was a polygamist. King David was an adulterer and a murderer. Can you imagine the unlikely people who have become ancestors of Jesus? In today's setting, men like Jacob, you would never trust. He, because he's a deceiver. Men like Judah, you would never trust your children to him or daughters or to him because he's a man who visits prostitutes. Okay, Rahab is a prostitute as well. That kind of woman, you would not trust her. She sees that kind of typical woman that would normally walk around the streets in the midnight hours of cities and villages. Then woman Ruth. Ruth is a pagan, worship of a different God, chooses to surrender and let go of her people and come and associate with the children of God's people. Solomon, 700 princes he married, 300 concubines, concubines he, he married. What a man. Was, a, was he a good ideal father? Was he setting example for men to follow him? No. He may have been the wisest man that ever lived, but in practice, he was corrupt and bad. Okay? Look at David. Men, Bible says, after God's own heart. He's an, he's an adulterer. He's actually, he actually set the murdering or the killing of, of the woman that he was having her face with. So these terrible people are part of the story of Jesus Christ. And the question is, why is it that Jesus' life is part of all these people? One or two is enough. But these so many people, their DNA was passed down biologically, and part of the DNA of these bad, unlikely people are part of the makeup of the story of Jesus Christ. What is the moral of the story? The story is that Jesus knew where he was coming from. And Jesus knew where he was coming. He is the only beloved child of God, but he is coming to relate to a degraded human society and country and life in this world. He is coming for the lost. He is coming for the despised. He is coming for the reject. What a marvelous Savior Jesus is. You know, many times we make the mistake of thinking that Jesus is expecting holy people to go to him, or righteous people to go to him, or church goers only to go to him, or people who preach the word of God, they are the ones that Jesus is with them. Now, my brothers and sisters, if Jesus had prostitutes as ancestors, as if Jesus had men who didn't have moral judgment to be part of his his ancestry story. If Jesus had ancestors who were bad characters, men and women, part of his ancestor story, the story is that Jesus is willing to turn corrupt people into incorruptible people, defile people into beautiful and holy people, dying people, resurrecting them, and giving them eternal life. That is the reason why Jesus came. So Jesus is the savior of sinners. Why is it that the nation of Israel misunderstood and missed that one point? Well, Jesus came for the whole human race to be clearly understood and identified. He came to humanity so that we can understand him. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, the Bible says, and the Lord commanded men saying, you must surely eat of every tree from the garden. Now this is interesting because this is where the promise about the coming of Jesus is being made here, and we'll trace it right through. Okay, here the Bible says in Genesis 2.16, I read again, the Lord commanded men saying, you shall surely eat of every tree of the garden. Now, when I was reading through the Bible, what I found out was when God created men, he creates men, and then 
he gives this, gives this instruction. That's what he does. Okay, so when he creates man, he needs an image, and then he tells him, you may eat of every tree, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. In verse 16, or 17 of Genesis 2 we read, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay? And then it's interesting because what happens here is that when God created man in his own image, he gives the instruction to Adam not to eat from the tree. After Adam receives that instruction, he creates Eve. So that means Eve was not part of that law giving. If you follow the chronology of the story written there, when God created man, he creates man first. Okay, we know the story. After he creates man first, man becomes a living soul, and then man goes around and sees the beautiful world God has created, gives names to the animals that God created, and then as part of that, God gives man this special instruction. You must not eat from this forbidden fruit. After that is over, God causes man to have a deep sleep and creates Eve. And Eve, when, they, when she was created, she was not part of that law that God gave. That's what I'm trying to say. When God told Adam not to eat from the fruit of the knowledge of, the, uh, knowledge of good and evil, that was given only to Adam. Eve came later. But a deception came through the one who did not, was there when God gave that advice. So what does it mean? It means that sometimes when you receive second person telling you of the direct instruction, like for instance in this case, God gave the law directly to Adam and Eve comes later and it is Adam's responsibility to explain the restriction that was placed on the tree to Eve, which Adam must have done it, although the Bible doesn't say it. I'm just, I'm just saying, reasonably speaking, he must have said that to Eve, or maybe God may have told him, I'm not sure. But if you see the book of Genesis, it seems like Eve was not part of that dialogue. But what happens next is that he, who was not part of the dialogue, who got the law through a secondary voice with, with Adam, makes a terrible mistake in misunderstanding the instruction that God gave. So what, I'm try, what am I trying to say? Misunderstanding comes when we don't understand what the witnesses are telling us. When someone witnesses God to you, you don't try and reinterpret to mean something else. That's what it seems like is happening here. God is telling Adam something, and Adam is getting that advice and giving to Eve, and Eve is, is making it completely different, and when Eve is confused, Lucifer came, comes in and tempts her. So it's very important to notice this very important point, number one. First point in this story is when you don't understand, when you don't understand God's word correctly, you'll be deceived, just like Eve. When you don't understand God's advice correctly, you'll be deceived, just like Eve. The Bible tells us that Eve sees the tree and sees and says, wow, this tree looks good and will make one wise. So that means she is having all these interpretations to interpret into the law of God and then drawing a completely different conclusion and she met this terrible decision. And we must be very careful how we listen. We don't listen to God's instruction or we don't listen to God's testimonies of, him, of, of himself based on our own perspective and views. That's what Eve is doing, we must not do it. And probably that is one of the reasons why Jesus had this burden. And so he's praying. You know, when he is just about to be crucified, he's praying to God in John chapter 17 and verse 3, and he prays this prayer that we all know. It says, and this is life eternal, 
that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Did you hear that? This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Okay, that means, what is he saying? Jesus is having this amazing pressure, this, this unusual sense of burden. And the burden is that, oh, I just wish the people of God understand me correctly, who I am, or know God correctly, who God is. That is his burden. So as his time on earth is coming to an end, he's making it a point of prayer, and he's saying, Father, I pray that they will know you, God, correctly, and they will know me correctly. Why? Misunderstanding of God's word and advice costs the fall of mankind. And misunderstanding of God's word, even now, will cause the fall of men and women and eventually go into hell. So with that basis in mind, let us trace the story of the coming of the Messiah and how misunderstanding crept in into the Old Testament church. There are two images of the promises of the Messiah we get. Number one is the image of a sacrificial lamb. The second image of the promise of the Messiah we see is a child born to crush the devil. Okay, so these are based on uh, in the book of Genesis, book of Genesis. So that means when men committed sin, now the plan of sending the Messiah was not an, after, not an afterthought. In other words, what I'm saying is the plan to send the Messiah was not a plan that God suddenly came up with because Adam and Eve hate from the forbidden fruit. No, it is part and parcel of the creation because in the book of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, the text says the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means that before the foundation of the world, the idea of a lamb who would be slain was already in existence. Before this world came into existence, the plan was in a, already in existence. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 20, we read, it says, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. I'm just reading the highlighted ones. So in other words, the Bible is telling us that the plan to send Jesus Christ into this world was not an afterthought. It was the emergency plan. It is almost like an insurance cover that God provided, a provision made just in case Adam and Eve may commit sin. And when they did commit sin, the part, or the, the plan that he had already devised before the creation story is kicking in and coming into place. Over here in Genesis 3 and verse 21, we get the idea of the sacrificial lamb that I was talking about. In Genesis 3 verse 21, the Bible says, unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord make coats of skin and clothe them. So that means that although the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of skin, I'm assuming that that skin probably was a lamb skin or one animal, an innocent animal had to die to have the skin removed by God so that that skin could provide the solution for the nakedness of Adam and Eve. So lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb of God that was to come and die for the sins of mankind was already portrayed in this particular verse. So that's why I'm saying the Messiah that was promised way down there at the beginning at this, this description. You see, he shall be a sacrificial lamb. The second one we find in Genesis 3 and verse 15. The Bible says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and the seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what we're seeing here is that Jesus Christ he would become this child who is a warrior now. Previously, he was the lamb that was to die for the sins of Adam and Eve. But this time, he is coming as a warrior to crush the head of the one who devised the temptation and caused Adam and Eve to fail. So you see, brothers and sisters, as a Christian, when we talk about sin, 
you don't talk about sin as just mistake restricted to human choice and misadventures. No. When you talk about sin, you must include the devil because devil is the father of sin. And way down there in the beginning, God is making provision to remove sin out of the sinner's life and also to destroy the one who originated sin. That's why the promise of Messiah comes in in these two forms. One, as the one who will sacrifice and remove sin from the life of Adam and Eve, and secondly, as a mighty warrior to destroy Mr. Lucifer and defeat him. So, what we're seeing here, the promise of the Messiah is the Messiah is a sacrificing, sacrificial lamb and a warrior to conquer, not an earthly kingdom, no, to conquer the evil kingdom and destroy the father of sin, who is the devil himself. So the promise in the garden, as I've written here, sacrificial lamb or the warrior child becomes the basis of the promise of the Messiah that the Jewish nation had to live with and talk about for as long as they've existed because it is revealed through Abraham. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. And God says, through you, I will bless all nations. Abraham is called out so that Abraham's genealogies, Abraham's descendants will produce this promised child that was promised in the Garden of Eden, okay? That promise will come through the lineage of Abraham. So that means that Abraham is just a mean instrument God is using his lineage to send the Messiah. Now, when you come to Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 15, uh, the promised Messiah gets a different kind of an emphasis. Over here we read, the Lord thy God will rise up unto thee a prophet from among the midst of thee, of thy brethren. Like unto me, unto him he shall hearken. So Moses is saying that there is another prophet coming after me. Moses was familiar with the story of Genesis because he wrote the book of Genesis. He knew the messianic tradition of the Hebrew people is rooted in the creation story. That means the Messiah will come as a warrior child. The Messiah will come as a lame slain from the foundation of the world. So yeah, Moses is taking that notion and he's saying this Messiah will not come in any other form, but he will come as a prophet like me, he's saying. So this time the Messiah is getting a prophetic label or prophetic identity on the Messiah. Previously, it has only two labels. One, the sacrificial lamb, the warrior child too. And this third time, now the Messiah is a prophet now. Now, when you read 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 5, the Bible says, he said unto me, Behold, thou art old. The children of Israel came to him and they said, You are old now, your sons no longer walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. So the Israelites came and said, look, you know what? All the other nations have kings. We have you as the prophet and judge. But your sons are not qualified. They are not living like you. None of you, none of them is fit to be like you. Instead of appointing uh, one of them to lead like you, why not you appoint a king just like us? See, it is... It is not God's idea. That's the point I want you to see. It's not God's idea, but they are copying the cultures outside of what God is doing within. And they want to be like others that they are seeing outside of what God, what God is doing. That is the danger. Sometimes we will see what the world is doing out there to copy the world and be a Christian like the world in this church. Sometimes we can make those mistakes. We observe the nature, sorry, observe the, observe the environment around us and try to model Christian life like the world. And that is the cause of misunderstanding of Jesus Christ. And that is dangerous. And that's the first mistake the nation of Israel is making here. Please give us a king, they said, in regret and grief. Prophet Samuel consulted with God. And God told Prophet Samuel, 
It is not you they are rejecting. It is me they are rejecting. That's okay. Appoint them a king. So they appointed a king. For the rest of the history of Israel, the Messiah that was promised as a lamb who would die for the sins of the world and would be a warrior child who would be born to conquer Satan has now become the prophet and now he changes a different title again in the book of Isaiah. If you look at the book of Isaiah, this is what it says. Of the increase of his government and the peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform it. So this is the progression I want you to see. In the Garden of Eden, Messiah was promised as the lamb or the warrior child. And then the prophet in Moses' time. Now the Messiah has now become a king, a kingly title now. Okay, this is very interesting. So I'm going to briefly summarize this now in the next slide. And look at this. Messianic image, the child of the woman, Revelation, uh, sorry, Genesis 3, 15. It's going to be a descendant of Abraham. Prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. King like David, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7. Can you see the Messiah's image changing as it progresses? Now, one of the reasons why the Israelites in the Old Testament made a mistake of missing the point and didn't identify the Messiah when he appeared in this world was because of these different labels that are placed on the Messiah throughout the Old Testament times. And I will, if I have time later, I will tell you this. If I don't have, we will do it next week. But let's go to the next one, how this changes again in Daniel chapter 3 and verse 25. He answered and said to me, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. They have no head. The fourth one is the Son of God. So here again, when Daniel and his three friends were being burned right in the burning furnace, someone else appeared. And the Bible says, Son of God. Did you know that the title, Son of God, is the same title used of Adam, who is the son of Adam, who is the Son of God? So you realize that this Son of God title is synonymous with almost human beings on earth. So Son of God, that means he is heavenly, he's not angelic, and yet he's a Son of God, just like any one human being would be a Son of God. That is consistent with the next prophecy. Because in Daniel 7 and verse 25, which is on the screen again, it says, I saw the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. You know, this Bible says that, that, in, that, um, that someone called the Son of Man. In Daniel 3, it's called the Son of God. And now it is the Son of Man. Is being brought right before the angel of days. And verse 14 of chapter 7 says, And there was given unto him dominion, glory, kingdom, that all the people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So, men, this time the Messiah is getting another title. Okay, I'm writing there, son of man. Messiah is getting another title, Son of Man. Okay, I'll brief, briefly summarize the same titles that I've used again. Okay, look at his progression here. Genesis 3.15, the child of the woman. Okay, a warrior child, descendant of Abraham. Okay, a prophet like Moses. Then king like David. And then now we see in Daniel 7, a glorified human being. This is the same Messiah changing as it goes. And then a uh, conquered woman needing help to return back to Garden of Eden, that is Eve. We, she realized the big mistake that she had made, and she needed help to bring her back to the Garden of Eden, and the promise of a son is met to her and saying, this is the child who will come and rescue you. So what we are seeing here is that each of the Messianic prophecies repeated throughout the Old Testament times is repeated in the context of those people's immediate needs. I repeat, the promise of the Messiah 
repeated in the Old Testament times is repeated in the context of those people in their own immediate needs. He needed a deliverer to bring her back to the Garden of Eden. So God promises her a child who would come and crush the snake and bring her back. And then Abrahamic faith. When Abraham dared to believe in God, Abraham told, uh, God told Abraham, one of your descendants will be the one who will bless humanity. In other words, Abraham, you don't have to invest your time and energy and knowledge in building up empires in this world. Be someone God has appointed to send the Messiah through your lineage. That means faith that produces obedience is the one that will lead you to identify the true Messiah. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, a prophet leader, because Moses was a prophet leader, providing leadership in a unique situation. And so the Messiah is parallel to that kind of leadership. Again, messianic, messianic prophecy revealed in the context of the need that was experienced there. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 7, we see a king. Why? Israelites needed a king. So the Messiah now gets a kingly title. And then in Daniel, becomes the son of man. Why? Because Daniel needed deliverance. Daniel needed a story more than the story that he was used to hearing. And now God is revealing to Daniel and saying, you know what, Daniel? There's something greater, something greater. Someone among you will be glorified. He will be the son of man, yet he will be the son of God. Exalted just like God. He called instead of seated next to God in the throne room of God. And therefore, son of God now becomes the son of man, will be exalted. So again, Daniel, though discouraged and lost in those confused conditions he was going through, is assured that someone mighty will come out of this world and deliver mankind and brings mankind right into the throne room of God. So finally, we look at a summary again. Child of a woman, descendant of Abraham, prophet like Moses, king like David, Emmanuel is promised in the same context. And then a suffering servant comes in. Then Jeremiah predicts him as the branch and the son of man, a glorified son in Daniel 7. And Jechariah, one of the last in the Testament, well, prophets that existed, predicted him as the brands again. So this is the story of the Messiah that came. Now, in closing, I'm not closing because the story closes, but today I'm going to close for this one, for our, our, our session this morning. And in closing, what I want to tell you is this. Messiah is promised in the context of those immediate needs. If the Jewish people could have seen the story of the Garden of Eden story and see why God provided the promise of Messiah. The promise of Messiah was only to destroy sin and destroy the devil. It is only through that. If the Israelites would have got stuck with that opinion and tried to interpret every other manifestation or repetition of Messiah, in that main thought, they would not have met the terrible mistake of rejecting Jesus Christ. They read the same Bible. They listened to the same genuine prophets. Yet they met a blunder and a terrible mistake of misunderstanding. Why? Because they were reading into the promise of Jesus Christ, of God. So today, brothers and sisters, the story of Jesus is misunderstood all over the world. One of the reasons why it is misunderstood is because we are reading into it instead of allowing the story to talk to us. Today, will we allow Jesus to talk to us? Forget about our religious affiliation, our titles, our names, our rewards, our popularities and gains, lost and profits, our health, whatever it may be that is so pressing and forcing us to come up with some very terrible opinions that we read into the Bible. Why not we allow the scriptures to come out and talk to us? The nation of Israel in the Old Testament times 
made this terrible mistake because they did not stand by with the original promise that God made in the Garden of Eden. Today, the story of Messiah has not changed. It is still the same today. As I told you, brothers and sisters, when Jesus was teaching in this world, thousands came to listen to him. They saw him performing miracles. They heard his beautiful preaching. They were touched. They were blessed. They were inspired. But you know what? When they went home, they went home. Others went home with the image of Jeremiah. Others went home with the image of Elijah the prophet. Someone went home with the image of Moses the prophet. Someone else went home with the kingly title of David. No one went home as the Christ, the Messiah. Is it possible that you may be making the mistake as well? And your perception of the Messiah, my perception of the Messiah is creating such a massive level of misunderstanding among ourselves that our misunderstanding is being passed to others instead of us uniting and singing the same chord because we are singing the same name Jesus. We are calling the same name Jesus. We are believing the same name Jesus, yet we are fragmented and is it, is it possible that the fragmentation is as a result of us reading into it instead of the voice of God talking to us. I pray that we will allow God to talk to us. That just like Peter, the power of the Holy Spirit will reveal the Messiah to us instead of us using our knowledge and skill and wisdom and earthly philosophies to divine the name of Jesus. We should just simply surrender and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to us. And the pronouncement that Jesus pronounced on Peter when he said, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Bazona. Flesh and blood had not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Upon this revelation, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he said. So today, brothers and sisters, why not you be like Peter and let go of human opinions and human ideas and human knowledge and your own biases and let's say, God, reveal to me the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior. Like never before, so that when I know that Christ, the Messiah, and the Savior, I will associate myself to him and be like him and live for him. May God bless you. Yes, Jesus is all the world to me and you. That means that what matters is not my opinion or your opinion or your pastor's opinion or church's opinion or your father or your mother or your tribal community's opinion. They don't matter. God's opinion matters most. For me and for you, Jesus is all that matters to us. And so today, I want us to sing this beautiful hymn.
Jesus is all the world to me. Thank you so much for joining in and singing this morning. I hope and pray that when you go after this service, you will look for that Jesus. And do not allow the world to interfere you and stop you when you go out like an angry lion looking for Jesus, hungering and thirsting for him. So he will reveal it to you. Let me pray and end our service today. Close your eyes. Almighty God in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning you have given to us. Many people may not be watching on a Sabbath morning. Others will watch at their own times. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Monday morning, Monday evening. Wherever it is, Lord, I pray that we will not make the mistake that the Israelites made. Not just the Israelites, but countless many others. They read into the Bible and miss the whole point of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of the Bible is the revelation of Jesus. The Jewish nation refused to see Jesus, yet they read the Bible. They read the Bible that was not Jesus included. As a result, they went their way, Lord, and only you know how they will end up. But Father, we have to learn from those mistakes. And please help us so we won't have to wander away, that we surrender to the revelation of your knowledge and we accept your knowledge and we allow your Holy Spirit to let Jesus live in us. Is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.